Hey friend, welcome to Authentic Performance, the podcast. My name is Nat and I'm your host. At Authentic Performance, our mission is to provide education and advocacy for all athletes, developing awareness surrounding identity, purpose, and health, so athletes can live well beyond their sport. This week, I sat down with Lindsay Mixon, owner and founder of the health food company LL's Kitchen. LL's Kitchen specializes in refined, sugar-free, and all-natural granola. Lindsay also played college softball for the University of Redlands. She shares about her personal nutrition journey, how she is making a difference with LL's Kitchen, and what NCAA softball was like for her in college. This is another good one, so buckle up. Sweet. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to chat with you. Um, I am going to give you a chance just to start off uh, to tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Okay. So my name is Lindsay. Um, currently, I am the owner and founder of LL's Kitchen, a refined, sugar-free, all-natural granola company. Um, but a little bit about me is I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, went to school at the University of Redlands, where I played uh, college softball. I was a pitcher, and that's kind of where I developed my passion for nutrition and just athletic sport, fitness, and kind of where my journey began and kind of what has led me to LL's Kitchen and kind of where I'm at now. Yeah, that's awesome. I, we'll get more into the that side of what you do now, but um, I want to talk a little bit about your time as a college athlete. So what was it like to play college softball, both like the good and the bad of that whole experience? Oh, sure. Oh, one, of my, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so I played softball at Redlands. The University of Redlands is a smaller Division three, So it is a completely different experience from a Division one school. And that was the, that's the type of school, type of team I was looking for. I wanted it to be a little more personal, smaller, just, and the main thing with softball was I wanted to play. Like, that's what I was adamant about. I knew it was a school I could compete at, or I could get right in there my freshman year. And overall, I had a fantastic college softball experience. My team was awesome. We did rotate through a few coaches, which adds an interesting element to a team and to a school. Um, But overall, it was great. I, I loved the experience. I loved I think I learned a lot of my life lessons playing a college sport that have really served me as an adult in my adult life and kind of developing into a career. Um, I think college is just has what, as with most people, but it's really like what shaped me and just kind of allowed me to learn my life lessons a little quicker. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really awesome. Yeah. What was your kind of schedule? Like, was it kind of hard to balance everything or being at, that D3 school was a little easier, like with the more personal, like support maybe that uh, made it easier or, or what was that like? Um, I mean, we definitely had smaller class sizes, so it was a much more personal relationship with your professors. Like most of them had you call them by their first name or it, it just had a little bit more of a spotlight on you where if you weren't in class, if you were slacking, like that did not go unnoticed. Um, and I think the schedule of being a college athlete It was difficult, but having things kind of planned for you, like, okay, we've got 6 a.m. weights, we've got 3 p.m. practice, like, it almost helped. Because if you didn't do your homework in the time allotted, or you didn't go see a professor during those specific hours, like, you were going to fail. So it was almost like it was a, it was a packed schedule, but it set, I felt like it set me up for success, like having a routine, keeping a checklist, staying on track, and just kind of being forced to be organized because if you weren't like it just wasn't going to happen you were going to be late to practice you were not going to show up for weights or something and then that just like wouldn't fly (laughs) yeah no for sure yeah I think like sometimes the structure just like forces you to be like using your time more wisely and more efficient with what you're doing which Like, I I don't know about you, but like in high school, I was just like super busy with other activities. Like I played three sports in high school. So it was like, I was always trying to be busy and it, I, I did well in school and I, you know, went to practice and I did everything I needed to do because it was kind of just like set up 
perfectly for me. And so yeah. like going to exactly. college, I feel like that's, and honestly, I feel like it probably helps a lot in later life too, of like you, you strive kind of more for like that routine and schedule, which helps you, yeah. you know, maybe not be doing your sport, but other kinds of things that you're, you're involved in in your career and everything as well. Exactly. And you almost, I, I didn't realize how much I would miss that. Like there's someone making me show up somewhere at a certain time. And now I don't have that. It's like, yeah. Oh God, like, am I going to do it? And it, it, it definitely set you up to learn how to make a schedule, prioritize, kind of tackle things as they come. Um, so yeah, that, that was, it's definitely been an adjustment. Even how many years ago did I graduate four years ago? It's, it's still an adjustment. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, while you were playing, did like the demands of your sport kind of change your nutrition or exercise habits or did that stay kind of consistent? Um, or I guess, what did that even look like with training and all of that? You know, I, I was, I was thinking about this this morning, um, at the division three level, and maybe this is where it's one of those biggest differences from a division one. We don't have, we didn't have a dietitian. We didn't have someone kind of making sure our nutrition was in order. Um, and so that added an interesting element. Um, I don't think, I think there's a little bit of a lack of education in maybe the lower level sports, just a little bit of like how to properly fuel. I didn't know. And that was something I was kind of trying to figure out as my journey went on, which it's, it's, it was tough, but I think the trial and error is almost what made it more satisfying now that like I've experienced that. Like, I feel like I know myself even more having gone through the ups and downs with it. Um, but there's definitely like 6 a.m. weights, a three hour practice later on. Like that's such a unique fueling schedule. Like you want to be fueled for weights. You want to be fueled later on in the day. What do you eat in the middle? How do you recover? Like yeah. it's definitely a, I think it's trial and error for a lot of athletes. And like what worked for me wasn't going to work for my catcher or my center fielder. Like it, it's different. Um, so that, that added an interesting element. <laughs> yeah, no, that was kind of same for me. Like um, and, and truthfully, like my trial and error kind of happened later on. Like we were just talking when I, like, after I was done with basketball, like I got a nutrition coach because I was like, I don't even understand. Like when you're, when you're playing a college sport and like you said, like you've got weights and three hour practice, like you're burning so many calories that you're like, I can't like almost can't even eat enough most of the time. Like, especially yeah. with females, like it's super common to underfuel. Um, yeah. because it's just like so much, but afterwards I was like, okay, well now I'm not, you know, running for two hours at practice, yeah. uh, like something needs to change. And so it was, you know, kind of that trial and error afterwards. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious to know just a little more about your relationship with food while you were a competitive athlete. Cause I know that's something like we were talking about social media and how awesome it is yeah. um, and educating people too. Um, so what, what did that kind of look like while you were playing softball? Yeah. Um, so going back to me, not really particularly knowing how to fuel properly going into college, my relationship with food was rocky. Um, I mean, I played softball. I knew I wanted to play at the collegiate level. So there's travel ball. There's all this competitiveness leading up to that. And I still don't think I knew how to fuel then. And now you're going to add a collegiate experience on top of it. And it's a whole other ball game. So I feel like I kind of grew up in the, the era and just kind of like cutting calories lower carb is better. And as an athlete, that's just not the case. So I had this foundation of, and it's terrible now that I look back on it, but like eat the lowest calorie meals you can cut out whatever you can, like save your calories, just kind of that like toxic mentality. And so I remember getting to Redlands and my schedules increased, my activities increased, my energy expenditure has increased. And I'm like, I'm hungry. And so I, I really struggled with my relationship with food. And I, I just now did a, a post on this kind of just explaining my journey and it had ups and downs, but at the end of the day, I, my bad relationship with food kind of got worse and then it turned into, okay, I'm hungry all the time. I'm eating more. Now I felt guilty for eating more. That's bad. I got to find a way to counteract that. And it just turned into this negative, like binge restrict cycle. And if anyone knows anything about fueling an athlete, that's just like wreaking havoc on your body when your body should be at like 
just a solid baseline, like fueling, resting, like you're supposed to be feeling good. And it was definitely a battle. Uh, I mean, carbs are our preferred energy source, their fuel. And I just did not have that mindset at the time. And I would love to go back and just shake my 18 year old self, but you can't, you can learn from it and share your story. Um, but yeah, so I had a up and down relationship, all of this going on, like while I'm playing games, while I'm going to practice and it was a battle, it was a fight, but this is also where my passion for nutrition developed. So I am thankful for that. And I've I'm thankful for the voice to be able to kind of share my story. Um, but yeah, it was it was a rocky road. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's more common than people think, like just that, um, you know, relationship with food that's not maybe um, encouraged like in a positive way too. So I'm curious too, just like with social media, because I know like just even like the way that athletes are built, like um, – I talked to a different like sports dietitian and he was like, like having a six pack is not probably going to be helpful for your sport. You know, like obviously yeah. different sports have different physiques, but um, like some, sometimes it's, it's better to be just stronger and maybe a little less lean, like for the performance of your sport. But then there's also this like standard of um, you know, what, especially with females, like what the ideal body type is. So did you yeah. ever experience like anything with that, maybe on social media or just like these expectations that maybe didn't align with what you really needed as an athlete? Absolutely. Um, so just for a little bit of context. So my freshman year, I was, my freshman year was my best year of my entire college career. I was larger. I was really strong. I was I was lifting some weight in that weight room and I had a really successful freshman season. And so after my freshman year, I gained a little bit of weight and that's kind of when my mentality just kind of started like to go up and down. And I was determined to lose as much weight as possible during the summer and come back like lean and fit. And I remember it was, it was like halfway into my sophomore season after I had lost a a solid amount of weight, I was lean. I was doing a lot of cardio I remember my coach called me into her office, sat me down. I hope she sees this and knows this was a pivotal point in my journey. Um, But I remember she sat me down and we compared my stats from my freshman year and my sophomore year. And she was like, what's going on here? Like, what's different? And I couldn't really think of anything. And, you know, it's, it's fragile to talk about someone's weight. But she was like, you're a lot smaller. You you've decreased in size and it's affecting your performance. I'm not telling you to go eat burgers and fries at every meal. But this is an example of you wanting to have an aesthetic look is not translating to your performance. And I remember that was kind of like my aha moment where, I mean, like you said, social media, you're constantly influenced and being fed other people's lives and you don't see the whole story. And I wanted to be one of those lean, jacked, ripped athletes and sometimes that's just not the best fit for your position on the field. And that was kind of my reality check. Like people can tell you things as much as they want, but until you like experience it for yourself, like where you can truly understand it, uh, that was kind of like my moment where I knew there needed to be a little bit of a shift. (laughs) Yeah. And it's crazy, like in different seasons, what like you can obviously change quite a bit of like your body composition and like what kind of exercise you're doing. But like, while you're an athlete, so much of your energy is put towards your sport and it, it can be really hard when you feel these expectations. Like I even remember, um, like I had a pretty bad relationship with food too. And I was playing college basketball and I remember like spraining my ankle and I was like, oh, like I can't practice for a couple weeks. Like, what if I gain weight? And I was like, thinking back, I'm like, what if I did? Like, it's, it, yeah. maybe that's what, you know, I needed in that time too. Like there, especially when you get into that cycle of like restricting yeah. and then binging, it's like your body doesn't want that, especially with like how much stress it's under while you're in that sport where like maybe after your sport, like you're more, worried about the aesthetics and that's just more of your like where you're at with your lifestyle and everything but that it's crazy how much your performance can change just by you know changing those 
eating habits a little bit. Um, and unfortunately, like there's still so much out there that is like carbs are bad and like low calorie. And yeah. it's like when you're an athlete, it's <sighs> so, so different. Um, and you yeah. need those things to be like functioning, not even just in your sport, but like going to class and like being a good person, like you need yeah. the energy source, which exactly. Is so Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, I think there's a little bit of, like I mentioned, they're just, at least for me, I know it's different at different levels. Some schools do a great job about this, but like, this is where social media is a great thing where edu like actual informative educational posts can be awesome. Like I've learned a lot from social media. Um, there can be great information. And I think it's important to get the good information and the correct information out there. Um, and I, I wish I had known and I had that. So I think that's something that is on the rise, which I'm so glad to he uh, hear and see. Yeah. So that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm curious a little bit about the mental health side of things. Like during this time, um, like you talked a little bit about like just the mindset that you had, um, was there anything that was kind of bothering you on the mental side of the, like maybe the game or just how you were kind of functioning, um, in relation to that kind of relationship with food as well? You know, it was, it, that was kind of like an interesting trifecta for me. Like I was experiencing all of these struggles and just kind of tough experiences mentally off the field. But for me, my like safe place was the softball field. I, I mean, as a pitcher, you're in the center of the field. You've got the spotlight on you. You are essentially controlling the game. And, you know, for someone who was struggling off the field mentally, it was, it was very interesting that that was the place that I thrived. It was like the field, I was the most confident version of myself. Like as soon as I stepped across that white line, like I was fearless, I was confident, I was intimidating, I was a little scary and I loved that. Like everything about me on the field, I felt like I was thriving. And I mean, it's a, it's a pressure filled position. You can be the hero or the zero in that situation but I loved that. Like, give me the pressure, give me the three, two count, bottom of the seventh, bases loaded kind of situation. And I, I felt like I could handle it. Um, so I think that college softball was my first kind of experience, even really learning what mental health was like, like, what is that? Like, is, is mental health always a bad thing? Like, is there a scale? Like, I didn't really know what that was. Um, and I guess my, my sophomore year was my first time I ever experienced like going to a counselor to like talk about mental health. And so I had really good experiences with it and really poor experiences with my mental health. And I think the first thing is even just talking about it. I think it's something that can kind of get swept under the rug or no one wants to hear this. No one wants to hear me complain or be a negative Nelly. Like I'll just suck it up. And I think that's where the fine line of being an athlete and like honoring your mental health can get a little blurred. Um, no one wants to be seen weak when they're this strong athlete on the field. And I think a lot of my teammates can attest to that too. Um, so that was the first time where I just really at least tried to like figure out like, okay, how am I doing? I think that's the first step in the first question. Like, how am I doing? Like check in in all your various areas of your life. Yeah, well, I think it's, like kind of a testament to what sports can be to people too, of like something that like kind of takes you away from maybe the stresses that you're experiencing outside of that. And I remember like my coach saying, like even we would have like a physical activity of like, okay, if you have something that's like stressing you out or worrying you, like write it on a piece of paper and leave it in your locker and then come to practice. And it was just a space where it was like, there are things happening outside of our lives and, and there are definitely like stressors within sports and stuff. But if you love the game, like it also can be a really, like you said, safe space where you get to leave some of those things behind. Um, and obviously like the mental health piece, like isn't always better while you're playing the sport. And sometimes it does impact your performance, but yeah. there's also that side of like sports are a really good vessel to like, figure things out and like work on your mental health while getting to be surrounded by a team and like with people that care about you and all that. So I think it can, it can fit into that, you know, really positive place and 
maybe help a little bit with some of those struggles that you might be facing off the field or court or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, that was my experience, which I guess is maybe a little bit unique. I know there's some people just don't thrive under pressure. Some people don't like that. They crumble. Like there's, there's a whole world of sports psychology and I mean, it's tough. Uh, I had plenty of failure moments, of course, too, but I still like, even after my failures, like I still wanted to get back in there. Like, let's try it again. Like I had just a very determined attitude. Um, so I guess it is a fairly unique experience as a college athlete. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to shift a little bit and talk about your background in nutrition. So, um, what kind of led you there and, and what role does that play in your life now? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like this all kind of comes full circle, but I think my, my struggle with nutrition is kind of what gave me the passion for it. Like I knew something didn't feel right. Kind of having this up and down relationship with food. Like I so badly wanted to just be able to eat a meal and not think about it again or not think about it two hours before I ate it. Like I just wanted it to be simple and I knew there was just more out there. Um, So after college, after a little bit of fuss with what I wanted to do with my career, I did earn my nutrition coaching certification. And with me personally, that was more kind of gaining just like a foundation of education. Nutritionist, nutrition coach, not the same as a dietitian. I'm the first person to say that. Dietitians go to school for years to learn ins and outs of the body, but I just wanted like a basic foundation. I didn't need all the extra. I just wanted to like learn how our bodies function, how we process food, what's a balanced meal, like just from a more scientific perspective. So I earned that and then decided the coaching aspect just wasn't for me. Um, I guess I could have tried a little harder, but I just didn't, I wasn't super passionate about coaching. I just wanted to learn and like see how I could share my story in other ways. Um, So that's kind of where, that was like the timeline of my like nutrition background came from. Um, So yeah, I mean, I still have my nutrition coaching certification. I mean, I share recipes, tips, all that stuff, but it's more of just like an internal passion for like getting a foundation. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes things like that, like I even, there was a period of time where I was like in between junior college and like transferring to GCU. And so I did like a certificate, certificate, certificate program with like (laughs) a Christian ministry, just because I was like, like for me personally, like how can I dive deeper into this thing that I'm passionate about? And I don't think it always has to be like, this is my forever career, but like it yeah. obviously provided you with that basic knowledge, maybe for yourself at, and maybe for others a little bit, but it's like, I think if you've got that passion for it, like it doesn't always have to be the like biggest part of your life, but it obviously like plays a role in the way that you, you know, approach nutrition and all that stuff anyways. Yeah. And so that's, mm-hmm. yeah, super cool. I'm curious to know a little bit about like, how you focus on sustainability for yourself in both nutrition and fitness, especially now outside of uh, being a college athlete. Yeah. um, You know, I think that kind of definition is always changing, but for me, I think sustainability is one. I had to find things I enjoyed. Like I, I do enjoy running now, but when I first started my fitness journey, I didn't like that. And in my head, I had it like, just like, plastered in there that like running was what was going to give me my ideal body. And it was this constant, I hate doing this. I have to do this. And it just felt like a punishment. So it wasn't sustainable. I'd run, I'd be hell bent when the motivation was there and then the motivation would die and I would just hate it. Um, and kind of the same thing with food, like what's something like chips and guacamole. That is my thing. I am a chip girl (laughs) and you know, I feel like for me, it was snacking's bad, like processed chips and crackers are bad. And I have to cut that out. So then I do great, like I said, with motivation, and I'd cut them out, and I'd be fine. And then I would eat chips and feel terrible about myself. And it was this battle like, yeah, but I love that. But now it's turned into I either have none of it, or I eat so much where I feel sick. And that's just that wasn't sustainable for me. So now Something sustainable is where I can still enjoy the things I like, but make it like part of my routine where it doesn't feel like forbidden or bad. 
so that's kind of my like approach to sustainability, like finding something I can stick to. It might be hard here and there, but it's something I can incorporate into my life, my routine and find a way to make it stick. Yeah. And I like that language too, of like realizing that there, there is this idea out there that like certain foods are good or bad, but that it really doesn't have to be, you know, one or the other. Like, um, I know one thing for me when I started like working more in the nutrition space of like figuring things out for myself, it was like, okay, this, like this cookie is like, there's no good or bad attached to it, but it might like not make me feel good today. So then I might choose not to eat it, but it's not like because it's bad, which is such a a label that is put on so many things of like, oh, the, the sugar is bad or like the carbs are bad. And there are definitely things that are not going to like benefit your health and your body in different situations. But also like something that I learned so much is about the like mental part of like eating too. Like if you're like restricting yourself and you're out at like a friend's birthday party and you're like so just consumed by the fact that you cannot have the cake, like then it's, it's not even just about like, what's the cake going to do to your physical body, but like, what is it doing to your mental health? Like if you can't enjoy those times with other people. Um, so I'm curious, like what balance kind of looks like for you in, um, making those decisions. And like you said, a little bit about like the, what sustainability is, um, how do you kind of balance choosing foods that serve you, but also like knowing that that mental piece or just, uh, you know, a balance is important. Yeah. And this was something I kind of experienced a long journey with. I, was in therapy, I was seeing a registered dietitian to just kind of try and get to like the root of this. And I think my biggest takeaway from that is once you start making food a moral issue, like good versus bad, it can take a step higher and turn into like, I'm bad for doing this. And I think that's really where it gets toxic. Um, but I'm like you said, I, I there are certain foods like a piece of pizza right before you go work out. Pizza is not inherently bad for you, but let's think about how this is going to make you feel. Yes, you are allowed to eat whatever you want, but is that going to fuel you the best? Probably not. Are you going to have a stomachache an hour later? Like, it's all about what's going to make me feel best right now. So there does have to be a little bit of give and take. I'm all for intuitive eating, and that is the epitome of intuitive eating. Like, you have to register how you feel and then think about, okay, how do I put this into use for what's going to be best for my body? Like, I feel like when I first started the concept of intuitive eating, like I can eat whatever I want. I could have ice cream for breakfast. I could have six slices of pizza. I don't have to only have one. And I think that's what a lot of people think that is. And it's not, it's getting to learn yourself and what makes you feel good and allows you to be intuitive. Like for me, I know in the morning I need a solid breakfast. I need something with protein, carbs, fat, and something that's going to keep me fueled. And there are some foods that just don't fit that requirement for me at what I need during the day. Is there a random day where you're like, screw it, I'll risk not feeling great. I want to enjoy this moment. Absolutely. But for me, finding sustainability is knowing that that's my breakfast that sets me up for the day or eating or not eating something before a long run or a workout, what's going to make me feel best. So it's kind of a, it's almost like a self-respect element too. Like you can enjoy things you love. You truly can. And I, I feel so much comfort being able to say that statement out loud because I do believe it. It's just a matter of like how it's going to make you feel. And like, it's just an approach that you kind of have to play with. So that's my like approach to sustainability is I know what makes me feel good. It's not always going to be perfect. And it's always something you're kind of learning and relearning and playing with. Yeah. And I think something that I had to learn too, is like, you think, oh, I, if I allow myself to just have whatever that, and like, I don't label, you know, certain foods as bad or good that like, I won't be able to then control you know, what I'm eating, but I quickly learned, like, even I remember a couple months after I had really been like focusing on the nutrition piece. And I was like, 
at a birthday party and they had like cookies and I was like, I, I don't even want it. Like it's, I, I genuinely am like completely content without having it. And I, I have this like positive mindset of like, I could have it. So I, I'm not like yeah. restricting myself, but I'm like, I, I don't even want it, which is I think kind of just a byproduct of like focusing on like building, you know, your healthy meals and getting the things that you need. And then a lot of times you just end up not even really wanting the things that you maybe previously labeled as bad. Um, yeah. And I think that also kind of uh, ties into that like mindset of abundance. So I want to know a little bit more about just like what, what you kind of think of like having that abundance mindset when it comes to fueling yourself. Yeah, for me, I think it was, and I, I felt like it was, it felt cheesy at times, but like reminding myself, like if I went into a meal where something I struggled with was French fries, like going into it kind of thinking like, Oh God, like this is a food I struggle with. They're higher calorie, whatever. Like the second you think that like, this is bad, or this is the only time I'm going to be able to have this. It just, it changes the way you're going to experience the meal. So like now I really like French fries, but I can go into a meal and know I can enjoy this now. I can like, they're in abundance. I can enjoy this whenever I want. Like I don't have to consume all of this right now or even just food in general. Like my body's not in this fight or flight mode where I don't know the next time I'm going to eat a quality meal. Like I'm feeding myself. I'm taking care of myself. Like I can enjoy this. I can eat whenever I want, whenever I need to. And there's not that like stress. Like I'm kind of okay is <laughs> That's kind of my perspective. So I think just constantly reminding myself, like, you're going to eat again. You don't have to, like, make this a all-in moment or anything like that. Just, like, taking a pause and just remembering, like, it, it's going to be there eventually. Like, it's okay. It's always going to be there. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like that's a pretty common, like, mindset of the, like, all-in or all-out. Like, some people are, like okay, I'm like fully commit, And I've, I've been guilty of this many times where I'm like, okay, like today I'm just going to eat whatever I want. Cause I've already screwed up. And like, I already had something that I probably shouldn't have had for breakfast or whatever. And yeah. I've had to kind of shift it a little bit to be like, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what I had at this time. Like, I'm just trying to make the best decisions for me. And if, if, today isn't like I don't feel great after and I'm like yeah I really shouldn't have eaten that like I didn't really want it but I just you know fell into that pattern like it's about like resetting and just realizing that that doesn't dictate like your next day and that it doesn't yeah. have to be like okay well I failed so now I'm done like just picking yourself back up like I mean I know you've mentioned too like it's it's not always going to be perfect it's there's going to be um, you know, times I don't even want to say failure because it's it's not a failure. Like you often feel like you are, but just you know, hiccups here and there where you're like, oh, that I sh I shouldn't have eaten that because I just really didn't feel good after. But you learn so yeah. much from just kind of testing things out with the way that you feel personally, which is also like so different for different people. Like I don't really eat oh, gluten yeah. or dairy now, but like that's not like a oh everyone should not eat this it's literally just like that doesn't agree with me so that's also a whole nother thing of like figuring out what works for you and then going from there and just doing the best you can every day because yeah it's not, not exactly perfect. <laughs> yeah exactly it's always I mean it, it's like it's trial and error always like you're always going to be learning adjusting changing and your body changes over time like like you said, some people can eat dairy and gluten and some can't. And I think it's natural to like compare. We're like, oh God, she's not eating gluten or dairy. Like that means I shouldn't, but I usually feel okay when I do. Like it just, it's, it, food can be such a stressful thing. And I, I wish I had turned inward a little bit more initially to just be intuitive. Like what makes me feel best? So like you said, it's very individualized. Like and I think it's important. Only you are going to know. I can sit here and tell you it works for me, but it might not work for you. Might, but it also might not. And that is okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about 
LL's Kitchen and what kind of the heart behind that is. Before we do, I just want to share that I ordered granola, like, I think it was like a couple weeks ago, and this bag is already empty. And I have another one around here somewhere. And so if you're listening and you need some good granola, I highly recommend. <laughs> Um, but oh, I want, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I want to give you the chance to kind of talk about what led you to create Ella's Kitchen and just the heart mm-hmm. behind that adventure. Yeah. Oh, well, this is, I, I do enjoy telling this story. Um, so it was after college, I had mentioned I earned my nutrition coaching certification and knew that like my heart just didn't feel in that. I still had a passion for nutrition. Um, and granola was always kind of a recipe I I just made, it was something I, I made it for friends, family. Um, and it was one day during the middle of COVID, I made a batch of my granola for my grandma in her kitchen. And she kind of gave me the idea, like, why don't you sell this? And it was a time in my life where things were, I had just no sense of direction. I felt lost. I didn't feel strong and independent. And this was like the first thing where I was like, huh, like, like starting my own business, like, okay. And I didn't even fully like embrace the idea. I came up with a logo, what packaging I would use, and just started posting about it on Facebook. I I earned a a permit to be able to do that, (laughs) but it was friends friends and family, and then friends of friends, and then it just started growing. And it naturally scaled to a point where we started going to farmer's markets, and then I upgraded to a commercial kitchen, and it just took this really organic process. Um, But kind of what started that was I mean, I know I mentioned all of this like food freedom and balance and no food is good or bad, but at the end of the day, there are things that you can continuously eat that make you feel great. Like, so we're refined sugar free. The only sweetener we use is a touch of honey. And kind of our thing is we use infused olive oil to add texture and flavor. Um, So, I mean, I was passionate about making something nutrient dense, like there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, And so that's kind of where I merged like my passion for nutrition and like a business concept. Um, So although it wasn't like a full fledged like a business idea right from the start, now I'm a business owner trying to grow my business. I'm a little more like dialed in and I've had the chance to like refine my plan. So that's kind of where I stand with it. Like it's a nutrient dense product designed to fuel you. And I'm passionate about helping others kind of like on their journey with how they feel and view their relationship with food. So although I've created a business that sells a physical product, I've, it's turned into so much more. Me sharing my story, talking about food, meeting other female athletes has been what's made it so worthwhile. So it's it's kind of a combination. (laughs) Yeah. that's So that's kind of the gist of it. Yeah. I'm curious, like what kind of the role of education is in this, because obviously like you have a very intentional like plan with what kind of ingredients you're using with your background and just understanding nutrition. So how do you kind of use, uh, I guess even like social media is obviously like a platform um, to kind of educate people. Not only like, like you said, it's more than just like having the physical product, like what, um, what role does education have in kind of this business as well? I mean, You know, I, for me, social media has been a huge thing. I've been able to connect with so many people and I really think, I guess it's educating, but I think just being authentic and sharing my story for what it is. And sometimes it's really hard to admit your like deepest struggles or share them. And I think there became a point in creating LL's Kitchen where I stopped being shameful of the really dark parts and learned that like, oh my God, every time I post about this, someone either says, thank you for sharing this. I've experienced that. I feel less alone. I feel like just by telling my own story, I've heard more than enough stories of other people who've experienced it. And I feel like that is like my my duty now is to just talk about it. I think that's the first step is sharing. And like, that's my form of education, I guess. Yeah, I think that's really kind of how it spreads. <laughs> Yeah. And it takes like a lot of courage and vulnerability to be able to do that. So I do want to just commend you on that because like, obviously it's not, not easy to share like some of those stories where like in the moment, like you felt like maybe you weren't getting it right and didn't know what was like happening, but it's such a, it is like a really good 
way to educate and encourage other people who are yeah. dealing with similar things. And um, yeah, I'm just like, when I first saw like all your granola stuff, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is so cool. And just such a sweet story of like how you got there too. So um, I, I just think it's awesome. And I'm grateful oh, that you're you. willing to share your story here and oh, just of course. With everything that you do. Um, I do want to ask, like, what are some of the qualities of Ella's Kitchen that kind of set you apart from other like health companies? You know, like a lot of people claim things or like try to make people um, see it as like a healthy option. But what what are some of the things uh, with your business specifically that kind of set you apart? Yeah. So there's the obvious one, which, you know, this actually gets to be sticky with some people, especially when you preach like an all foods fit mentality. But the only sweetener we use is honey, which is a, it's not a refined sugar. It's unrefined. It's a natural sweetener. And we just use a touch. So our focus is quality ingredients, no preservatives, all natural organic, like just quality ingredients, things that make you feel good when you put them into your body. You don't have to worry about the crash, anything like that. Um, so all of our ingredients are simple. There's no additives, nothing funky. Um, so it's refined, sugar-free, all natural. That's our tagline. But like I mentioned, the thing that makes us the most unique is our use of infused olive oil. So it's not a seed oil. It's not a inflammatory oil. Um, olive oil just gets, there's a lot of health benefits from it. And I personally really like olive oil. I'm Italian. I grew up consuming a lot of that. Um, <laughs> So those are kind of our main things that make us unique. But I guess the biggest one is the texture. It's not your typical like crunchy, hard granola, like a cereal. It's almost like a cookie. So we call it snacking granola designed to eat right out of the bag. Just enjoy on the go. Like it's just a little different. It has a unique texture. So that's kind of my little spiel. But that's really what makes us different is Honey is the only sweetener, no cane sugar, no preservatives, nothing like that. Yeah. And it's actually crazy because I was like, okay, like these are really good ingredients, but like, what's it going to taste like? Because, you know, you never know. And it's so good. So I'm just so Thank impressed. You. <laughs> um, and then to also just have like something that you're confident like eating because you're like, I mean, and, and again, like not that eating stuff like that, even if it had other ingredients, it would be bad per se. But if you want to be conscious sure. of the things that you're eating, and a lot of people are, then it's like, sweet, I know exactly what's yeah. in it. And it's so yeah, so absolutely. And I've, I've kind of figured out my like grasp on it. Like, I know we've talked about like, making food moral, like good versus bad. And that's not, that's not my place to do that. I don't think anyone should do that. And cane sugar isn't inherently bad, but there are ingredients that make you feel better when you're consuming them regularly. And cane sugar, I love a good brownie. I love an edge piece of a brownie. Like that's something I'm not cutting out of my diet. I just believe there is a time and a place like we talked about to consume stuff like that. Yeah. Should you be skipping birthday cake at your grandpa's 80th birthday? Absolutely not. Should you be worrying about the sugar content in your pancakes on Christmas morning? No. Like. There are things where you should enjoy life to the fullest. Don't be stressing about what's in it. Like there's a time and a place to stress about your ingredients. And for me, it was how many granolas you go to the supermarket and there's just a bunch of added cane sugar where it doesn't need to be. Or like a cheap seed oil. Again, not inherently bad, but like pick your shots kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So that's my spiel. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, as we kind of wrap up, I just wanted to give you a chance if there's anything else that we didn't cover that you wanted to add, no pressure, but um, if, if we missed something. God, we, we really hit like my whole journey and it's yeah. it's always kind of nice for me to kind of say it and feel it like a full circle moment, but that's kind of my journey and really like it's it's been up and down and I just... I hope that someone could feel inspired that like no one's path is linear. And I still struggle with that too. Like, oh, this person's achieved so much. Okay, absolutely. They totally have. But like, I'm sure they had some up and downs to get there. Like it takes time. It takes struggle. And like, sometimes going through the struggles are really, I don't know what make it a little more worthwhile in the end. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, you already mentioned 
authenticity while you were answering <laughs> a different question, which is awesome. Um, but the last question and the one that everyone gets to answer on this podcast is what does it look like for you to live authentically? You know, I think doing stuff like this, being confident and a little more accepting of kind of the journey I've followed and like owning it, like you can own your struggles, you can own where you're at, even if it's not exactly where you want to be. I think it's just important to be honest with where you're at, where you need to go, where you've been. And I, I think that's the first step in being authentic and, and certainly what I'm trying to do. And I think it feels really good. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Well, thank you so much thank for you. doing this again. It's, um, it's so sweet to just get to hear your story and, and where you're at now too. And, and kind of the, the journey that you've had and, um, yeah, I really appreciate you just oh, sharing. Of course. I know that people are going to be <laughs> encouraged by it and it's so nice to like finally get to chat and I know I love it virtually but um yeah thank you so much of course thank you for having me this is very fun thank you so much for listening to authentic performance the podcast we would love to hear what you found valuable in this episode so send us a dm on instagram at authentic performance or leave us a review on whatever platform you enjoy most. We want to thank you for your continued support of this project. It truly means the world. We also want to invite you to be a part of the Authentic Performance fam, so follow us on socials and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. For more information about how to get involved or to see how we're supporting athletes, go to theauthenticperformance.com. Finally, let us know what you want to hear on the podcast and who you want to hear from. We want to give you the best possible resources and support, and your feedback helps us do that. In the meantime, think about how you can live authentically. See you next time.